The song says, I'm lost without you. And the truth is, without, without God, we are nothing. Or we can do nothing. But we are valuable or very important to God. Uh, the fact that He bought us with His own life, with His own life, He offered His his son to the cross for us to be saved. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 Salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. I don't know if you knew or knew Steve Harvey Somebody knew Steve Harvey. Steve Harvey is a renowned uh, TV host. He's a comedian, American comedian. And he, but he's also a motivational speaker. He's actually a good uh, motivational speak, speaker. A week ago, in an interview, he said, There's no one way to heaven, no one way to God. He said, just like a television or cable channel, there are at least 800 cable channels. Different channels, different access, and they are still entertained. In, sh in short, Steve Harvey said, there are many ways to heaven or to God. Now this word came from a man who claimed to follow God and his charity. But sad to say, many people share the same belief and thought as well. I read from Creation Today, it's a, it's a mag magazine, and there's an independent study that based on the current trend, that 40 million young people who are raised in Christian home, home could walk away from a life with Jesus by the year 2015. And creation today said this is a spiritual pandemic. 40 million. And it's a very it's a very scary thing to scary thing to think that our children and our grandchildren will live their lives without Christ. And we have to learn and grow together as a people of faith. And we know from the Bible that any person without Christ in his life will spend eternity apart from God. Separation from God means eternal punishment in hell, where the fire does not quench, the Bible said, and the fire does not dry. So we as Christians, I'd like you to tell, I'd like to tell you this. We should be a good witness for Christ. Steve Harvey is a good speaker. He can influence many by his word. But sad to say that his words are flawed. We are called to be a witness. And just like in the court of justice, the judge that does not require us a witness to be eloquent, but rather the judge will just require us to just speak the truth. And Jesus is the truth. <coughs> Just speak about Jesus. Just share His words to others, to our loved ones, and to all the people. Also, we should make it a habit to bring our children to church. I have observed here in our country, we don't speak much about God in the public, or even in our private conversation. Not allowed to speak about God in the school. So if we as parents will not speak to our children about God in our home, and even more, not to bring them in the church, our children will grow up without a little, even a little knowledge about God in the Bible. And that is why some of them will just create their own ideas of God. 
just like Steve Harvey. And, but some of you may say, I don't want to enforce my faith on my children. Let them discover the truth. But how about uh, how about encouraging our children to go to school? We encourage them to go to school, we admonish them, and we even enforce them to go to school. And why is that? Because we know the benefit of it. There, there are benefits of knowing God and becoming a Christian. Proverbs 6 22 said, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Also, we should teach people or our children the word of God. Many people believe there are many ways to heaven because no one told them that there's only one. The Bible said, just like the first I read before, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. John 14, 6 said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 said, for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. There is only one way to heaven. There is only one way to God. When Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, he prayed to the Father and said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And we know what happened to Jesus. He was Ha, he, he was hung on the cross. God was not willing. Why was that? Because there is no other way. There is no other way. No solution to human trouble. Apart from the atoning work of Christ. Apart from the death of Christ on the cross. There is no other solution. There is only one way to heaven. That way is Jesus Christ. I would like for us to Please stand up and we will give. We will thank God for the salvation that He has given to us. Let us all praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we stand before you, Father God. We acknowledge your Lordship, O Father God. We thank you, Lord. No one is worthy. The Bible said in Revelation said, The Lamb that was slain, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Lord, there is no other worthy of God to be offered as a, as a sacrifice. The requirement should be blameless, should be spotless, and you are the one worthy. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we remember your death on the cross of Calvary. And as we partake, Father God, this emblem, this element, representing your blood, your, your body and your and your blood that was shed on the cross. We would like to thank you, Lord. Express our love and gratitude to what you have done. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake of the bread. In the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, and remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us drink of the wine. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your life, for your death. Because of your great love to us, you willingly give yourself and offer yourself as a sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. Lord, empower us always, encourage us always to Proclaim the good news of salvation all over the world, especially in this time of uh, crisis or pandemic. We know, Father God, that we are in the last, in the end of time. So, Father God, help us, empower us, encourage us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, O oh Lord. We can do nothing without you. We worship you, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's give thanks for all the tithes and offerings that we've been receiving. Heavenly Father, we just acknowledge that you are our creator, that you are our provider. You give us breath to live, breath for life, and you give us everything else that we have as well. And Father God, we just honour the instructions from both the Old Testament and, Lord, the New Testament, where the Scripture tells us that we have to set aside a portion of our income for your work. And so, Father, we've done that today. And we just uh, pray, Lord God, that you'll bless every person who's given generously this morning. And, Lord Father God, we pray for these funds too, that uh, we will use them wisely so that your work can grow. So that all people will come to know Jesus and God. Amen. And uh, it's my pleasure now to uh, hand over to David, who's going to share the word with us this morning. So thanks, David. Thanks, Mark. Good morning. Let's let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for every day that you give us. Lord, we thank you for your word, which is living and active. Lord, we pray as we open up the Bible now, as we read your word, that you would speak to us, that you would speak into our hearts, that we would be sensitive to the leading of your Holy Spirit, we pray that you would reveal more of yourself to us through your word. We pray that we would be challenged, that you would stir us, Lord, that we would know you more through this word. We thank you for your presence with us right now. And we uh, come before you, Lord, uh, humbly acknowledging that you are the living God. This is your living word. It is so precious to us, Lord, and we are so blessed through having it and through knowing you, Lord. So we just commit this time right now into your hands in Jesus' name. Lord, have your way in us. Amen. 
If you have your Bibles, please open up the Old Testament, uh, 2 Chronicles and chapter 16. Second Chronicles chapter 16, and I'm going to read the whole chapter. In the 36th year of the reign of Asa, Baasha, king of Israel, went up against Judah and built Ramah that he might permit no one to go out or to come in to Asa, king of Judah. Then Asa took silver and gold from the treasures of the house of the Lord and the king's house and sent them to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, who lived in Damascus, saying, There is a covenant between me and you. And there was between my father and your father. Behold, I am sending you silver and gold. Go, break your covenant with Baasha, king of Israel, that he may withdraw from me. And Ben-Hadad listened to King Asa and sent the commanders of his armies against the cities of Israel. And they conquered conquered Ejon, Dan, Abel-Main, and all the store cities of Naphtali. And when Baasha heard of it, he stopped building Ramah and let his work cease. Then King Asa took all Judah and they carried away the stores of Ramah and its timber with which Baasha had been, uh, Baasha had been building. And with them, he built Giba and Mizpah. Verse 7. At that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and he said to him, Because you relied on the king of Syria and did not rely on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Syria has escaped you. Were not the Ethiopians and the Libyans a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he gave them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose hearts is blameless towards him. You have done foolishly in this, For from now on, you will have wars. Then Asa was angry with the seer and put him in the stocks in prison. For he was in a rage. He was in a rage with him because of this. And Asa inflicted cruelties upon some of the people at the same time. Verse 11. The acts of Asa from first to last, are written in the book of kings of Judah and Israel. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa was diseased in his feet, and his disease became severe. Yet even in his disease, he did not seek the Lord. He sought help from physicians. And Asa slept with his fathers, dying in the 41st year of his reign. They buried him in the tomb that he had cut for himself in the city of David. They laid him on a bier that had been filled with various kinds of spices prepared by the perfume's art, and they made a very great fire in his honour. Your life is going perfectly. Everything is amazing. You have seen victory after victory. And it's clear to everybody who looks at you 
that the Lord has blessed you abundantly. And then, all of a sudden, there becomes a, a problem, a crisis. Just out of nowhere. So you devise this well thought out plan. The plan succeeds. The crisis is avoided. And you are very pleased with yourself. Though there is uh, one small problem. In all of your wisdom and your cleverness, you have left God out of your plans. You've failed to consult God. And God, as he so often does, he brings a Hanani into your life to reveal to you that your wisdom is in fact foolishness. Does a story like this sound familiar? Does it sound familiar to you? I think it is familiar to each of us. We've all been there. We've all been foolish. But it's what happens next that makes all the difference. You see, when God sent Hanani to Asa, it was to remind him that he acted foolishly. But Asa graduated from foolishness to stubbornness. I mean, foolishness is one thing, but stubbornness is a whole new ball game. Any time that we are faced with a Hanani in our life, we, we have to remember that God doesn't send these people to us to bring guilt and shame upon us, but he brings them to turn our hearts back to him. And that's what's going on here in Second Chronicles. And it's a fascinating story. There's a lot going on. Uh, let's take a closer look. The first thing I want to talk about uh, uh, King Asa is his wisdom. So this is what we're going to, we're going to look at. King Asa, we're going to look at a king's wisdom. Then we're going to look at a king's foolishness. And then we're going to look at the king's stubbornness. So that's where we're going. A king's wisdom, a king's foolishness, and a king's stubbornness. So we'll start with his wisdom. You see, King Asa was a good king. He had accomplished lots of good. And as far as kings and rulers go throughout history, we've seen some terrible rulers, haven't we? Throughout history, we've seen some really bad rulers. We've seen Hitlers and Stalins. We've seen Nebuchadnezzars and Neros. You see, Asa was a good king. He had done much good. These were good times in Judah. These were times of blessing. Rest and peace. Asa was doing much reform within Judah. And if we look back, there was someone called Azariah that God sent. God sent Azariah with a message to Asa. And we read about that in the previous chapter, in chapter 15. The first verse of chapter 15. The Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Obed. And he went to meet Asa. See, God sent 
Azariah. And the message that Azariah had for Asa was a good message. It was a message that Asa wanted to hear. It pleased him. He liked what he heard. God was encouraging him and he was saying that if uh, the Lord is with you, take courage, you will be rewarded. And the message at that time from Azariah, it spurred King Asa on. It spurred him on to greatness. It, it, it stirred him up to um, institute these great reforms that he would remove the idols, that he would remove all the detestable things and that he would um, stir the people under him to seek the Lord. He made a covenant that the people of Judah would seek the Lord. It was a nice message that Asa wanted to hear. He, he made sacrifices. He removed the idols. He entered into this covenant with the Lord. Asa was encouraged. And more than that, his enemy, because the, the kingdom was divided, Judah and Israel, and, and the enemy was rebuked. Um, and, and Asa really liked what he heard. He liked this message. It's nice when God sends us uh, an Azariah. But now... A problem comes. See, because the kingdom is divided, we have Judah, we have Israel. Israel at this time had utterly abandoned God. And it says in chapter 15, this was part of Azariah's message to, to Asa. It said that Israel were with, without the Lord they were without the law. They were without a priest. These were bad times in Israel. And that is in chapter 15. If, if you, to get a good idea of this, it would be good really to read a, a couple of chapters and see what's going on in this story. But yeah, Things weren't good for Israel at this time. But this, this king of Israel, Baasha, he comes up with this cunning plan. And his plan is to attack Judah. But it's not uh, like a full frontal attack. You see, he goes and, and sets up headquarters in Ramah. He builds Ramah, right? He, he sets up about five, seven, ten kilometres away from King Asa and Israel, and his plan is to control the road in and out of Judah. His plan is to stop all the supplies in and out and the people in and out, and, and thus he can control the town. So Asa recognises that this is a big problem, and what's he going to do about this problem? And in his wisdom, he chooses bribery and takes money from the Lord's temple and bribes the king of Syria to make an alliance with him to defeat this enemy attack. And that's what's happening. And that's what does happen, and it succeeds. And Judah and Syria join forces. The battle is won. And Baasha, king of Israel, flees in fear. I'm giving you like an overview, a summary of what's happening in these, throughout these three chapters here, 14, 15, 16. Okay? Um, but the victory in the eyes of King Asa, this attack was real. Asa responded in his wisdom. He sought help. He subdued the enemy. He protected his territory. And he won the day. But there was another problem now, a new problem. You see, God was not pleased with the way Asa had gone about this. Why? Because what Asa believed was wisdom, God said to him, was 
foolishness. And another messenger, like before, Azariah was a messenger from God. A message that Asa liked. Now there's a new messenger, Hanani. And it was a message that he didn't like so much. God has Hananiah's everywhere, I think. You know, maybe sometimes we've, God has used us. We're not prophets, we're not seers, but maybe God has used you to go and speak a word to someone. And in obedience, we go and speak the word that God has put on our heart. Sometimes we're on the receiving end. We're like Asa, where someone comes and speaks a word to us. God has people that he uses like this everywhere because God knows everything that is going on all the time. There's no surprises for God. So Hananiah appears out of nowhere. And God's message through Hananiah, God's message was that this is foolishness on your part because you have not trusted in me. This was a matter of trust. And God is saying, who do you trust? You've seen so many miracles. It, it says here, you have seen uh, the defeat of the Ethiopians, of the Libyans. All right, we're in verse 7 here. At that time, Hanani, the seer, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, because you relied on the king of Syria and you did not rely on the Lord your God. You see, that was the problem. His trust, who he relied on. He didn't rely on God who had given him so many victories already in the past. He'd forgot about them. Did all those miracles God is saying to Asa, did I ever let you down? Were you ever disappointed? And, and we can look at this and it's exactly the same for us, isn't it? We've seen miracle after miracle in our life and these amazing things that God does for us all the time and then all of a sudden some problem arises, something comes up and we rush ahead and we forget and we, we do things in our wisdom and we forget to do things God's way and we do them our way. And God says that's foolishness. And in, chap uh, in, in, in verse 9, we come to the key verse. The verse that maybe you have highlighted in your Bible. The verse that maybe you have memorised. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless towards him. And we kind of like to quote that first part and forget the second part where, where God's saying you've done foolishly. But that first part of this verse, like it's, it's a verse that we know and, and I bet you uh, many of us have it highlighted in our Bibles because it tells us that God is all-knowing, that God is always looking. And, and what's God looking for? Hearts turned towards him. God is ready and willing and able to strengthen and to support those whose hearts are turned towards him. What? God is not looking for our wisdom? God is not looking for our perfection? God is looking for hearts blameless before him. Hearts turned toward him. You see, God can work with a soft and tender pliable heart
And I know what um, some of you may be thinking right now. <laughs> ah, he's always focusing on heart. It's always a heart condition. It's always a heart problem. It's always a heart issue. And, and I know what you're thinking because I was thinking that myself. I'm thinking to myself, why does every message come back to a heart condition or a heart issue or a heart problem? Is it like, is it a hobby horse of mine or something? And I realised, no, it's not. It's because every page I turn in the Bible is about the heart. It's about our relationship with God. God is focused on our hearts. God cares about our hearts. And he's looking for hearts that are turned toward him. It's on every page that we turn. It's what our Bible is telling us. Every message is essentially a heart issue. It is God's focus. The Bible, God is concerned with your heart right now. Today. This morning, one verse particularly um, came to my mind as I was focusing uh, on this message today. And I was drawn to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The word of God challenges us and stirs us, encourages us, corrects us. All of these things. The Word of God is living and active and speaks to us on every page from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And it discerns the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. With Asa, there were real consequences of his foolishness. Like this, there would be no more time of peace. It was from now on, it was going to be a time of war. That was the consequence because he had already in chapter 15 made a covenant with God, with the people to seek the Lord. And he forgot about that and he makes a new covenant with this king of Syria, this heathen king, to join forces and make an alliance where God was saying that king of Syria should have been your enemy, another one when you had trusted me that we would have defeated. But instead you turned to him for alliance and made covenant with him when you forgot that you had covenant with me. The only thing worse than foolishness is stubbornness. So we've seen a king's wisdom and a king's foolishness and now we see a king's stubbornness. You see, foolishness can be forgiven. Stubbornness is a much bigger issue. You see, Asa here at this point, where are we? Verse 10, verse 11. Verse 10, Asa was angry with the seer and put him in the stocks in prison. Asa had a choice. Pride or humility. Listen to what God's saying and respond or dig in his heels. Anger and Rage kept Asa from a right relationship with God.
more than his foolishness, his stubborn heart caused him to be separated from God's presence. And this is a pattern that we see throughout the Bible. You see, we've seen foolishness in our Bibles. We have seen King David, who I'm sure we will all agree was much more foolish than what Asa had done. But he responded differently when he was confronted with the Hanani. You see, David was confronted with Nathan. And he responded. He turned his heart towards God. And what about the New Testament? What about Peter? And what about Paul? We see the same thing. Peter denied Christ. Peter done some foolish things, but he repented. He turned his heart towards the Lord. He was teachable. He humbled himself. That's the difference. But I want to point out something else that's happening here, just like as a, a, a little side note. <laughs> the innocent suffer. Hannah and I was obedient to what God was telling him to do, to go and deliver this message to Asa. Hannah and I was obedient and he landed in prison for his obedience. It's here. It's in the Bible. Sometimes we wonder why we're not blessed because we're walking in obedience. We're doing what God is telling us and things are going wrong. Things are going from bad to worse. Has that ever happened to you? We feel like we're listening to God and we're walking in obedience and things just going wrong all over the place. And we think, well, how does this work? What's wrong? What am I doing wrong? God, why are you punishing me? That's what we think sometimes. But the truth is, innocent people suffer. And we see it in our Bible. And we see it right here with Hannah and I. And it's not just a one-off with Hannah and I. Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers and he ended up in prison for his obedience. And Jeremiah was also put into prison for his obedience. And Peter and Paul and many throughout history who have lost their lives for their obedience. And Asa here inflicted cruelties upon the people at that time. He put Hananiah in prison and in his rage and anger, he inflicted cruelties. What does that mean exactly? What did he do? We don't know. We can imagine. We have seen some cruelties from rulers and kings in the past for Christians under persecution, for, for people that were um, you know, against uh, what the king was doing and who stood up against the king. He inflicted cruelties. That's all we know. He was shooting the messenger. But what does all this tell us about the innocent who suffer? Maybe God has bigger plans than my prosperity. Maybe God has bigger plans than our comfort. I don't know. It's here. Do with it what you will. Ignore it if you want. But it's here. Now disease sets in. Asa 
has this disease in his foot and his disease becomes very severe. But let me tell you one thing. The disease in his foot, in his feet, are nothing compared to the disease in his heart. That was the problem. Some commentators say that the disease in Asa's feet was divine judgment. In other words, it was God's punishment for Asa's foolishness. I don't think that's clear. The Bible doesn't tell us. And it could be because in other places it is very clear that that's what God is doing. But here it's not clear. Could be punishment. It could just be a, a natural consequence of living in a broken, sinful corrupted world, that we have disease and we have sickness. It's, it's not here. It's not clear. Um, but there are many people who believe that this is uh, God's punishment on him. But one thing is, um, his foot disease was minor compared to his heart disease. Asa didn't learn from his mistakes. You see, he... Yet even in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but he sought help from physicians. Not that there's anything wrong with seeking help from physicians, because doctors and medicine are a blessing from God. But the problem here was that Asa bypassed God. His heart was stubborn towards God. And he didn't learn the second time round, and he didn't come back to God. He didn't repent. He, he didn't humble himself. He wasn't teachable. He dug in his heels. And as this disease in his feet grew, he blocked out the Lord. It's not that he, he sought the doctors. It's that he didn't seek the Lord. He didn't trust the Lord. Turn to God. Turn to God. Turn your hearts to him. If he is sending uh, Hannah and I into your life, don't be stubborn. Listen to what God is saying. He is not sending these people into your life to rub your nose in it. He's not sending these people just to show you your foolishness, but he's showing you your foolishness so that you can turn your heart toward him. And you have a choice. King Asa was foolish. Let me see a show of hands. Raise your hand if you've never been foolish. I said, raise your hand if you've never been foolish. Can't see any hands. You see, Asa does not own the rights to foolishness. When God sends a Hananiah and someone to, to bring us truth, no matter how uncomfortable that truth may be, it is at that point that we have a choice to make. We all want the Azariahs in our life because they give a, a message that we want to hear. The Azariahs are nice, the Hananiahs are necessary. Asa was a good king, and he had many years of doing good before the end of his life when things changed for him. But even the greatest kings of the world 
the greatest kings that this world has ever known. Even they leave a lot to be desired. But there is one true king. The king of kings. That will never disappoint us and never let us down. There is one king that we can rely on, that we can trust, that rules with righteousness and justice and mercy. One king that gives us eternal life, that has an everlasting kingdom. If you have never known this king in your life, I want you to seriously think right now because we don't know what happens when we walk out these doors. We don't know what happens in the next hour. We don't know if we have tomorrow. That's just a fact. But Jesus, this everlasting King, wants you to turn your heart to him. He wants you to give your life to him. And if you have never done that, there's no better time than right now at this very moment that you know that God is speaking to you and God is calling you. And you know that he is drawing you to him Don't be stubborn. Don't ignore that. Don't push that aside. Don't let all the distractions of life get in the way. I'm going to leave that with you. If you need or want to uh, know more if you want someone to talk to the leaders mark simon you can speak with you can ring them you can come and talk to them it's not about a one uh, minute feeling all emotional coming up the front saying some words this is about a lifetime of committing your life to the lord It's about a journey, walking with the Lord. And the Bible doesn't tell us that once we commit to serving the Lord, that everything is going to be perfect. We've seen innocent people suffer. We've seen good people prosper. This is a broken, fallen world that we live in. But Jesus promises us everlasting life, eternity with him. Amen. We don't serve him and follow him for the things that he can do for us, but for what he has already done for us, that he has given us life. He is the giver of life. Thank you, Father God. Glory to your precious Ah, name. Thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for your goodness, for your mercy, for your grace upon us, for every day that we have. Every day is a precious gift. The air that we breathe. Lord, I pray that we would be desperate for you, hungry for you, thirsty for you. Thirsty, Lord, to know more of you, to know your word that we would let your word um, penetrate into our heart 
to judge our thoughts and our attitude of our hearts, Lord, that we would listen to your voice, that we would embrace the Hananias in our life that you send to us, Lord. I just pray for every person here right now that your spirit would continue to work in us and to speak into our hearts and to draw us closer to you. In Jesus' precious name, amen.